we are inheriting Star Trek. You know, if we don't embrace and use the elements that are familiar to the world of Trek, what are we doing? We, we should do something else and call it something else. Well, Klingons are ingrained in the tapestry of Star Trek as any other villain, so you desperately want to get them in sooner than later. I do think that the idea of doing Star Trek and bringing Klingons into the world is an obvious and cool challenge, and how do you do it? And we were very lucky to have Neville Page and David Anderson work on bringing the Klingons to life. You gotta pay respect to who the Klingons are, but I also do something new, but don't violate the, the lore and the culture and the history of them. It's always that delicate balance. One of the early notions that I had was that they might be at war with themselves as well, much the way that we are on our planet, to the point that the things we do also destroy our planet. And I thought it might be interesting that the spot of Kronos that we were in was this toxic wasteland, like post-nuclear bomb disaster. So this whole thing is on our stage, this whole crazy. This whole thing is on our stage. Wow. Kronos, again, was, you know, going back to the idea that we build, we try and build whenever possible. Even as a model, you'd have meetings after meetings after meetings about it, and you would see the model, but you don't quite understand the scale of it. I couldn't even compute what it would look like in the finished form. A lot of the visual effects would be in actually getting there. And once you arrive there, once you've established this kind of enormous space, then a lot of it we were hoping we could shoot in camera. And so the art department, Andrew Murdoch and those guys, built this huge set. I remember walking on the stage the first time seeing the cutouts to show us the scale of it and it was massive. I think the stage is, you know, 40,000 feet or so and we filled every inch of that stage. It really was amazing and that light that Chris Pramperin and Dan built was this huge yellow light on the wall with whatever it was, over a million watts of electricity. There are about 1,200 pars up there on a the wall that are shining through this lens to create this gigantic light source from a very short distance. 30 moving lights, and then uh, about 75 top lights, not to mention various side lights, strobes, and probably another you know, 150, 200 par cans around the set. Even though people associate Star Trek and science fiction films with a lot of visual effects, there's no doubt a lot of hand work and heavy craft work done on these sets. You know, for instance, you can see the sculptors back here working on this huge wall that we've designed. So um, there's a lot of craft, which is awesome. We love it. Get him his name straight. But we spend next these days. Who are you? Very hard. This is Tommy. JJ. I'm JJ. It's like. It's like Sports <laughs> Illustrated for Klingons. Mary? You look so handsome. Oh, I know, that was Spock, I'd be nervous. <laughs> nervous. The costume was created, many of them, and were shot for the first film, but the scene was cut out. Because of time and, frankly, it felt a little bit off point, and so even though I loved the costumes Michael Kaplan designed, we cut the sequence. I was quite disappointed, as was JJ, because it was one of his favorite costumes. He said, don't worry, they'll work in the next film. We never saw them without their helmets on. And so in this movie, we had to figure out what do they look like when the helmets come off, which we definitely wanted to do. And so David Anderson and Neville Page working together came up with a great design and a great makeup. It's, it's really what defines the Klingons, kind of their forehead and their hair. So in looking at the forehead, I thought it'd be interesting if that forehead ridge shape continues all the way around the back of the head. Uh, the piercings, the idea behind that is kind of like marking the side of your, your World War II bomber with victories. They mark their bodies with victories, uh, either with piercings or scarification. We then will print out three-dimensional models as reference models that I will give to the makeup department. And the makeup department will then interpret those on top of our selected actors. Good morning, afternoon, what's up? We're about to make a transformation. Yeah, this makeup is a long one. This one actually takes about four and a half hours. Yeah, it's one of those old professions, prosthetic makeup where the actors suffer for their art. <laughs> yes, and it gets hot. The jewelry is the last touch here. Now I am officially blinged out. <laughs> You know, it sort of honors what has come before, but like in the many different series, they were all very different. We followed suit, and so you know, the look that you see in the movie, I think, is a pretty cool 
uh, intimidating look and you know the need to withstand the scrutiny of IMAX so the makeup had to be great and the application had to be great which I think David really did an amazing job with. There's an argument about sort of which is the true Klingon language. It's been featured in the Star Trek franchise uh, in varying forms of uh, correctness. I let that fight be fought uh, without me. I actually made up Klingon for all the Star Trek films, so I guess I'm the go-to guy. So I guess no one can complain if this doesn't sound right to them. Oh, they can complain. They'll definitely be able to complain, and I'll have to explain to them why it's, it's right anyway. She's learning lines incredibly well. She's a very, very quick learner. She's pronouncing them right. It's like zip, zip, zip. You know, I'm impressed. That's one of them. Box, please. We go. Grab her face, please, sir. It's always scary at first, but you're so curious to get into it and to really know what every word means, and that way you get the intonation right. And then once, you know, your costumes are on and you've rehearsed it, then it's like you put in all the passion, and it just sounds really exciting. Zoe, who did such an amazing job with, you know, all the Navi stuff in Avatar, once again proved that she's really good at learning alien languages. But now I must go shoot something else, so join me, shall you? Camera. Yeah.